Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about spinal injuries, rehab, and considerations. Uh, so starting with acceleration deceleration injury, uh, that is commonly what is called whiplash. Um, so acceleration deceleration refers to uh, the idea that the head is moving in acceleration in the frontward direction or in the anterior direction, and then we decelerate and it goes in the opposite direction. Okay, so acceleration, deceleration injury, that is whiplash. Uh, so the head moves in one direction and the facet joints and cervical muscles that are acting eccentrically to counter the motion are injured. Okay, so as the head is moving in the anterior direction, it would injure the posterior structures in terms of uh, the muscles that are acting eccentrically to try and decelerate the head that is moving in the anterior direction. Uh, so those muscles would be injured. Um, and then when we go backward, oh, and I also should mention uh, the joint capsules of the facet joints in the posterior side would also be stretched. So we'd have like a, um, a sprain of those joint capsules as we go forward. And then as the head reverses and goes in the opposite direction, these anterior muscles would contract eccentrically to slow the posterior movement or restrain that movement. So these would be injured from that stretch. And meanwhile, the facet joints in the posterior are now being compressed with a great amount of force. So the facet joints would be sprained as we're moving in the anterior direction and then have a sort of compression injury or like a crush type injury when we move back into hyperextension under force. So the facet joints, depending on how much force this happens with and how, how severe the injury is, uh, the facet joints can be um, pretty severely injured. Uh, but on top of that, it would also be the anterior and posterior neck muscles that um, would also be strained uh, while they're contracting eccentrically to try and control the movement. So typically the anterior and posterior cervical muscles require gentle rehabilitation in addition to um, however those facet joints are being addressed. Uh, so most often when, when the effects of whiplash last for a long time, like there are people who have um, injuries from whiplash that um, they're experiencing, you know, for a decade after the actual accident or after the injury. Um, and most often that is, those are the facet joints that have been injured to that extent that they haven't healed in that length of time. Uh, so it really requires good rehabilitation with the appropriate um, modalities to address whiplash. Um, so of course, physical therapy, chiropractic is really helpful. Um, certain modalities of mas massage therapy would be very helpful like uh, neuromuscular therapy or myofascial release. Um, so there are lots of different modalities that can help not only the muscles in the front and the back to recover, but also those facet joints. Uh, cervical radiculopathy is a condition of radiating nerve symptoms caused by pressure on the cervical nerve roots. Okay, so radiculopathy in any case would be where we have some kind of impingement or injury to a nerve and it's causing radiating nerve symptoms anywhere down the length of that nerve. Uh, so it's a type of referred pain that specifically is caused by impingement or injury to a nerve. So cervical radiculopathy, we're talking about um, cervical nerve roots that are experiencing radiculopathy. Uh, so that would include, any radiculopathy would include pain, paresthesia, muscle weakness, and atrophy in the areas that those nerves are supplying. So in this case, it would be in the cervical region and or the upper extremity. Uh, so cervical radiculopathy would be caused by anything that causes injury or impingement of uh, the cervical nerve roots. So that could be degeneration or disc pathology. Um, it could be an acute injury, so some kind of impact. Uh, it could be hypertonic muscles that are surrounding the path of those nerves. Um, cervical radiculopathy can also mimic radial tunnel or carpal tunnel syndrome um, because those same nerves that are impinged in those two locations um, are also 
potentially could be impinged uh, at the cervical nerve root. And then the symptoms would be the same because in any case, it's just radiculopathy of those same nerves. Um, and so the symptoms would look the same. And that's why, again, I emphasize that it's important when there's any kind of radiculopathy that we address the entire path of the nerve uh, to see where the actual injury or impingement is taking place so that we address the problem in the correct location. Uh, so the location of the impingement may be determined by assessing the joints of the upper extremity. Okay, a brachial plexus injury uh, can be caused by traction force, so like we've stretched the nerves, or impingement, so we're pressing on the nerves of the brachial plexus. Uh, so this is common in contact sports. Uh, so you especially see this like in football, it could happen um, either way, it could be a traction or an impingement. Um, like in football, it could be if somebody is holding down a shoulder pad and then your head gets pushed this way, it would cause a stretch there and that could injure the brachial plexus. Or it could be that you get pushed this way and it causes an impingement on that side that's closing. It can impinge the nerves between like a shoulder pad um, and the neck and head that's coming over. So it happens in either direction and it can happen in any sport, um, any contact sport, especially. Uh, so it would just be a stretching or a crunching of those nerves in the brachial plexus. Uh, causes an immediate pain, burning, or an electric shock feeling in the upper limb. Um, all very typical nerve type symptoms in an acute injury. Okay, thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, so first we should say, what is the thoracic outlet? Uh, it's the space, it's the interscalene triangle. So the space between uh, the scalenes, um, the costoclavicular space. Okay, so the space between uh, the clavicle and the ribs and the subcoracoid space underneath the coracoid process right where pec minor crosses on top. Okay, so thoracic outlet syndrome is pressure on the neurovascular bundle where it passes through those spaces I just described that make up the thoracic outlet. So the neurovascular bundle that's passing through there includes the brachial plexus, the subclavian artery carrying oxygenated blood out to the upper extremity, and the subclavian vein carrying deoxygenated blood back from the upper extremity um, back leading to the heart. So, um, thoracic outlet most commonly happens at the subcoracoid space where pec minor is pressing on the neurovascular bundle against the rib cage, uh, or it also can happen um, where if the scalenes are hypertonic, it can also impinge at that location. So those are the most two common uh, ways that thoracic outlet syndrome happen. Um, and so it, it's caused by things like poor posture, a drooping shoulder that depresses the clavicles, forward shoulder posture, wearing a heavy backpack, or some kind of acute trauma. So those are just some examples of things that could um, close those spaces that I described that are part of the thoracic outlet, and any narrowing of those spaces could cause impingement of the structures in the neurovascular bundle. Uh, overhead athletes are especially vulnerable because when uh, the glenohumeral is in abduction and or flexion, it's changing the orientation of the scapula and the clavicle and decreases those spaces. So when you're moving into those positions um, frequently and often with great amount of force, uh, that can uh, develop into a thoracic outlet syndrome. So when someone has this condition, uh, they would have reduced circulation. Usually they'd have reduced circulation in the upper extremity uh, because the blood vessels are being impinged um, and they might have radiculopathy or uh, nerve type symptoms uh, because of the impingement of the brachial plexus. Okay, thoracic spine pathology. Uh, so when we have injury or pathology in the thoracic spine, because it has very little mobility, we often experience the effects of that pathology above or below the thoracic spine. So when there's injury or pathology in the upper thoracic, most often we will experience the pain or dysfunction in the cervical spine because it has to make up for uh, whatever the dysfunction is in the thoracic. 
So the cervical is moving abnormally to make up for whatever's happening in the upper thoracic. And then same thing in the lower thoracic, the lumbar spine has to move incorrectly and generate the improper amount of forces and all that to compensate for pathology or dysfunction in the lower thoracic. Okay, so thoracic spine injuries normally are experienced more in the cervical and lumbar spines. Um, depending on the nature of the injury and what exactly is hurt, um, pathology of the thoracic spine also can affect breathing and cause pain with breathing, and especially if there is a rib injury. Okay, nonspecific low back pain is another diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that um, if someone's been evaluated and all other diagnoses have been excluded, like you, they get imaging done or whatever tests and evaluations done, and you see that there are no other identifiable injuries, then this would be a diagnosis of exclusion that they've excluded all of their possible diagnoses and this is what they would categorize that injury as. So it's a general classification of chronic low back pain that is commonly idiopathic, meaning we don't know what caused it. Um, about 13% of cases are estimated to be caused by dysfunction at the sacroiliac joint. So when the sacroiliac joint is not moving correctly, the lumbar spine has to make up for whatever um, lack of stability or mobility is occurring at the sacroiliac joint. So then the low back would become more stable, so reduced range of motion or more mobile, increased range of motion to compensate for whatever dysfunction there is at the SI. So that increase or decrease of mobility in the lumbar spine um, because it's above or below what is normal, um, will cause changes in muscle activations and changes in the force that's going through those vertebrae and through those discs and cause pain. Um, physical activity is encouraged in this case because inactivity usually will worsen the condition. Um, so physical activity is generally encouraged with all types of back pain and back injuries because often uh, physical in inactivity could be part of um, what the problem was in the first place. So it could be being sedentary, having poor posture and, and other factors that could contribute and cause low back pain in the first place or back pain and throughout the spine in the first place. And so often physical activity um, is encouraged because it can help uh, correct the dysfunction and improve the pain. Spinal stenosis. Uh, stenosis in general is narrowing of a space. So spinal stenosis is narrowing of the vertebral canal or intervertebral foramen. So narrowing of the space where the spinal cord is passing through or narrowing of the space um, between the vertebrae where the spinal nerves are coming out of the spinal cord and going out into the periphery. Uh, so it increases stress on facet joints and causes compression of the spinal cord and or spinal nerves, depending on where the stenosis is taking place. Uh, most commonly it's the result of age-related degeneration or congenital abnormalities, like the bone just sort of grew that way in a way that's impinging on that space. Now, interestingly with this one, um, the severity of the stenosis is not correlated with the severity of the symptoms. So how much pain someone is in or how much dysfunction they're experiencing is not reflective of how much encroachment of the space there is due to the spinal stenosis. Uh, so it really just depends on specifically what is being impinged um, and, and that causes certain symptoms or certain severity of symptoms in the person, uh, but someone might have greater stenosis with lesser symptoms and vice versa. Okay, disc injury. Uh, disc degeneration includes loss of water and protein from the nucleus pulposus, so the jelly inside the jelly donut of the disc, uh, which increases the stress on the annulus fibrosus, the donut part of the donut. Um, so as the disc degenerates, we lose some of the um, elasticity and some of the, the liquid that forms the jelly inside the donut, which is important to help absorb the forces and the stress that's going through the disc. And as we lose that, the stress 
increasingly has to be absorbed by uh, the annulus fibrosis. And if it's not able to do that, and it's not able to keep up with the forces and the stress that are being produced, um, then that's where we see these injuries. So the increased stress may lead to disc herniation or protrusion. So disc herniation is a ruptured disc when the nucleus pulposus is forced through the annulus fibrosis. Okay, so a disc herniation is when it is completely ruptured. So the annulus fibrosis completely ruptures and allows the jelly to escape the jelly donut. Okay, so that is a disc herniation. Disc protrusion is a little bit short of that. Uh, that's where, uh, we also call that a bulging disc, uh, but that's when the nucleus pulposus, the jelly in the donut, protrudes and bulges into the annulus fibrosis, but the annulus fibrosis is not completely ruptured, so uh, the nucleus pulposus doesn't completely escape. So in either case of a herniation or um, a protrusion, in either case, we encourage physical activity uh, because it does help improve recovery and facilitate healthy rehabilitation. Uh, so it might be a little bit painful and you might need to ease into it, um, but it will improve rehabilitation. Uh, now with both disc injuries and with nonspecific low back pain, like we talked about a moment ago, I wanna remind you what we discussed in the previous video about erector spinae and how extreme of range of motion into hyperextension and into flexion uh, should be limited um, in people with lumbar spine pathology, whether that be disc pathology or low back pain, even if it's nonspecific. Um, because of the effects biomechanically that has on erector spinae and the increased and in abnormal forces that occur as a result. Okay, sacroiliac pathology can be caused by a variety of different things. Uh, it could be pathology of the pubic symphysis. Um, so you see that like um, during pregnancy or in the years following pregnancy, there could be injury to the pubic symphysis during childbirth or it could be the effects of the hormone relaxin during pregnancy on the pubic symphysis that could cause that joint um, to be injured or function abnormally, uh, which would cause the sacroiliac joint to have to pick up the slack uh, either by coming hyper or hypomobile depending on what happened at the pubic symphysis. Uh, an injury like falling on the buttocks, so if you fall straight back, um, that could put a force and or kind of a jolt into the sacroiliac joint that, that causes it to be injured. Um, misstepping, so that would be like you're walking down the street and step in a hole that you didn't see or something like that. Uh, that again would put sort of a jolt of force through um, the sacroiliac joint. It also can come on more gradually with chronic causes like asymmetry. So asymmetry of movement, asymmetry of muscle force, asymmetry of bone shape, things like that. Uh, abnormal biomechanics, so abnormal movement patterns, uh, hypertonicity of hip flexors or hamstrings, abdominal weakness, uh, differences in leg length. So one leg shorter than the other, uh, the sacroiliac joint really takes the brunt of that. Um, so that's when you might wanna put like a lift in the shorter shoe, in the shoe of the shorter leg. Um, to make more even or same leg length essentially when you're walking and that would take the pressure off the sacroiliac. Uh, so correcting any muscular imbalances or abnormal movement patterns may improve the condition uh, just depending again on what caused it and how severe the condition is. But it, if it's caused by muscle imbalances or the way that we're moving, those are things that we can solve to improve this condition. Okay, so that is all I have for you in this lecture, and I'll see you in the next video.